Good morning, everyone. It is wonderful to see you on this uh, spring-like day. I think we're going to have the 80s temperature uh, today. Isn't that, isn't that great news? And uh, the Masters is happening, spring's in the air, and, and what a glorious day that we can be here and worship God. Uh, for those that are just visiting with us, whether in person or online, thank you for worshiping with us. I'm Pastor Warren, one of the pastors here at Genesis. Uh, my co-pastor Jeff will be bringing the word this morning. And what we are looking at over the next several weeks is, is Jesus relevant? Some 2,000 years ago, historically, this person named Jesus revolutionized the world. There has not been one single person individual ever to change the world or impact the world as Jesus has done over the last 2,000 years. But the question is, is he relevant today? In our post-enlightenment era, in our country, Western civilization, in our community, in our homes, or even in our individual lives, is Jesus relevant today? We're going to be looking at that over the next several weeks. As we go to the Lord in prayer this morning, I invite you uh, to pray along with me as we prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that as we're gathered here this morning today, that you are ever present with us. May all that we sing, all that we say, all that we do, glorify you today. And Lord, I ask that you will open our hearts and our minds and our ears to receive the message that you have for us today. And will it move us in such a way that our lives are transformed more like you? I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to stand as you're able and let us pass the peace with one another. standing and you can join along singing whether through the hymnal of page 111 or the words on the screen.
and sorrow. How great is all, how great is all for me. How great is all, how great is all for me. How great is his love. God so loved the world, he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And that's good news. God loved us. God gave us Jesus, who modeled and taught what love looks like. Now, back in the beginning of the year, Warren and I were, were sitting down, and we do this about every two to three months. We were sitting down, and, and we mentioned together that we wanted to start a, a series a sermon series with you guys on Galatians chapter 5, where Paul talks about what it looks like to, to bear fruit, you know, uh, to bear fruit, what it looks, looks like to live like Jesus. Evidence that we're being Jesus in the world around us. Like I said, he calls that fruit. Paul gives us the image of a fruit. Like, you know, an apple tree is an apple tree because it, it bears an apple, you know, an orange tree because it gives you an orange. And, and he said, for us, the fruit means that we're living like Jesus Christ. We're living like Jesus. For example, he said, and these are the characteristics of Jesus himself when you think about it. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, or patience, dealing with people, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So we had this, it was in the background of our thoughts, that's where we were going to take you and, and move with you, um, fruit of the Spirit, living like Jesus, and, and then we came in here in January, and, and we had our visioning meeting, and one of the individuals said, you know, they asked us as pastors, they said, um, can you teach us? Can you show us how, how do we share with those around us, you know, that this whole faith thing, that church, that Jesus is even relevant and that's the question that many of us ask in fact actually bbc they they recently asked their listeners their listening audience this same question they gave them two choices around the issue uh, of 
is Jesus relevant? Are Jesus' teachings relevant? And they ask basically, when you look at the questions, you know, is what Jesus taught 2,000 years ago, is it limited to that time period? Or is it something that applies to us today? Should we be listening to Jesus or should we be following the laws and, and the ways of the world? Anyway, so we were thinking about this, this conversation, fruit of the Spirit, uh, living like Jesus, and it led Warren and I to think, is there any connection, anything in common between the two? You know, the one, is Jesus relevant, and the fruit of the Spirit, you know, living like Jesus. And as we were sitting in one of our planning modes, of course, the answer we came up with, yeah, Yes, it is. Jesus is still relevant, so relevant, necessary in our lives and in the lives of the world around us. And as soon as I, I put that line down, because we know we, I type my stuff out to just to get myself thoughts collected. This is where I'm going to need you. And um, I'm going to need you to shift right now. I love you. And, and, I, and I had this thought, you know, the... Um, the, the question was, you know, what the world needs now is love. And I started to, to think about this, and I, and I asked Tiffany, I said, Tiffany, do you know the song, What the World Needs Now is Love, Sweet Love? And, and she said, of course. And the reason I asked her, because she's like, I won't tell you how many years younger, but she's a lot younger than me, and I want to make sure it's something relevant that Georgia might not even know it, though. But she's going to go to YouTube, and she's playing the background, so you're going to be good, and we're going to plant that seed. But, um, but if you're familiar with the lyrics, it's sort of like this. You know, what the world needs now, it starts with the chorus. What the world needs now is love, sweet love. It's the only thing that there's just too little love. What the world needs now is love, sweet love. Not just for some, but for everyone. And so it's got this beautiful chorus. And then it goes in like this prayer, like petition conversation with God. It's like, Lord, we don't need another mountain. There are mountains and hillsides enough to climb. There are oceans and rivers enough to cross, enough to last till the end of time. And, and then there's that chorus, that beautiful chorus, and it's like this petition prayer that continues with God. Lord, we don't need another meadow. There are cornfields and wheat fields enough to grow. There are sunbeams and moonbeams enough to shine. Listen, Lord, if you want to know what the world needs now, love sweet love it's the only thing that there's just too little love what the world needs now is love sweet love no not just for some but just for everyone everyone <sighs> love love what the world needs is love. Kimberly Elkins, she wrote an article in Guidepost a couple of years ago, and, and she was looking at the backstory of the song, and, and she was talking about how longtime songwriter uh, Hal David, he came up with the chorus, you know, what the world needs now is love, sweet love, and, and um, he could never get past the chorus. He could never get verses to go with the chorus, so he just tucked it aside, did nothing with it. And then one day he was driving from his home in Long Island, going to meet his, his riding companion, Burt Bacharach, in, in Manhattan. And, and on the way, he realized that, you know, what it needs is more like this prayer, this petition to God. You know, what the world needs is, you know, Lord, we don't need another mountain. And once he had that thought, it's like the rest of the, the course just started flowing from there. And then, of course, he, he told his partner, Burt Bacharach, uh, put the, the notes to it. So that's why I appreciate you playing it. So that way, hopefully someone will go back and want to go to YouTube and listen to it later. Now, the song, it's been recorded by many artists since then. It's like Tiffany said, well, yeah, I know the song. It's, it's in many movies. And, and it is. You'll be surprised how many movies it's in. But I, I want you just to think about the time period when the song was written. If you're a history major or some of us looking around might have been alive during this time period. Uh -huh. <laughs> if you know history, what was going on during the 60s? You know, there was this civil rights movement. There was the Cuban Missile Crisis. There was Cold War. There was Vietnam. And the world was on edge. 
And so in contrast to what the world had to offer, this psalm, the psalm proclaimed that what the world needs now, instead of fear, instead of hate, instead of racism, what it needed is love, sweet love. And here we are, 60 years later, and I don't know about you, especially after yesterday, uh, I think the world is still living on edge. And I think our world needs love. Is, is, is faith, is, is living like Jesus relevant? What the world needs now more than ever is love. I mean, think about recent articles or posts, news feeds. Take politics. Politics, I mean, we are more divided than ever before. Or think about how, like last year, you know, our largest cities in the United States, they had more hate crimes than ever before. Racism, sexism, a denomination that's divided. There's war in Ukraine, Gaza, and then last, yesterday, we had, what, Israel and Iran? A couple of these with mass shootings. I mean, I hear a gunshot almost every three to four nights in my neighborhood. It just seems like a norm. So to counter the divisiveness, this violence, hate, what the world needs now is love. Love. So, so is Jesus relevant? I want you to think about this one. Because what did Jesus call his followers to do but to love? Love. In the longest discourse in John's Gospels, 20% of, of John's gospel, his final hours, he's, he's talking about um, what he desires, his vision for the world, his vision for the disciples. It's the time that Warren touched on a couple weeks ago, he washes the feet of the disciples. But it's in there, he reminds them this, by this, everyone will know that you're my disciples. They'll know you, you're a Christian, they'll know you're a follower of mine. If you love, if you love one another. Now, later on in chapter 15, I was doing a wedding yesterday, and, and, and this verse came to my mind, you know, you know, where later on in the discourse, Jesus tells his disciples, he says, you know, you didn't choose me, but I chose you, and I appointed you so that you should bear fruit, fruit that must last. And guess what he said that fruit should look like? Love. Love. This is my command. Love one another. Again, evidence that we're loving is fruit. Evidence that we're living like Jesus, fruit. Paul himself said it is fruit. Again, the fruit, evidence of the Spirit, that God is at work in our lives. And guys, if you're not doing these things, then it means we're not living like Jesus. Uh, the fruit of the Spirit. The first one is love. The fruit of the Spirit, evidence that God is at work, evidence that we're living like Jesus is love. So if we are a follower of Jesus, love is to be at the center of what we do. In fact, if we do anything without love, if love is not at the center of it, the Apostle Paul would say it's meaningless. He would say it doesn't matter how many times, if I put it in context today, how many times you come to worship, how many times you go to Sunday school, how many times you go to United Methodist Men or United Methodist Women, how many mission projects you do. He would basically say, if love is not at the center of it, it's meaningless. In fact, yesterday, like you know, some of you know, I did a, like I said, a wedding in Fredericksburg. I was coming back last night, and, and many of the couples that I, I married, they wanted to do the, the 1 Corinthians chapter 13, that, that love chapter. And I often remind him that Paul is writing to a dysfunctional church. You know, not that people don't ever get along in church. Um, nah. But that's what he's writing to. That's what he's writing to. And, and here's what he says. If, if I speak in, the, the speak in the tongue of men or of angels, but do not have love, I'm a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and knowledge, and if I have the faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. Again, you could fill it in the blank, put it 2024, if I'm doing all those things I listed earlier. And if I do not have love, it is nothing. He said, if I give away all that I possess to the poor, give of my body to the hardship that I boast, but do not have love, 
I gain nothing. He said, without love, it's meaningless. Without love, it's meaningless. But with love, it's everything. But the question is, are we loving? Are we as Christians loving? Does the world see love in us? Are we bearing fruit? Are we bearing fruit? See, I, I, I think this is why the, the world asks, is Jesus relevant? Because they don't see a difference between us and the world. I think often we in the church have uh, this perception problem. Anybody ever been to a high school reunion? Sorry, Rosemary. Did you ever notice at the Rose at, at the Rosemary? Did you ever notice at the at the high school reunion there was these group of people that were the popular ones at high school, and they don't think they've changed a bit? Reality check. <laughs> I just get tickled with it. I just think it's so funny. Uh, reality check. So so that happens, but it happens in the church. It happens in the church. So I say this because in two thousand twenty one. Uh, the Episcopal Church, they worked with Ipsos, and Ipsos is this international marketing research firm. A and they wanted us to see how we saw ourselves as Christians, how the perception we have of ourselves versus what other religions, how they see us, or better, my favorite group, the, those unchristians, the, the non-Christians, the, the de-churched, how, how do they perceive it? So, so they asked Christians, like you ask the church, I know if I ask these same questions here, I'd probably get these answers, right? We're giving, we're loving. So they, the people who identified themselves as Christians said, top four on the board, it's like family feud. Top four, uh, giving, compassionate, loving, respectful. In fact, you don't even get to a negative. Rose, let me go to the, ne the next one. You don't even get to a negative till number 10. Number 10, which is judgmental, 90%. Everything else is 40% above. We see ourselves as respectful, friendly, honest, humble, sharing. No negative till number 10, only 19%. I say that one, lift that one up. Because then you go to other religions. Buddhists, Hindu, how do you know, Muslims, how do they see us? <laughs> they see us as judgmental, hypocritical. Self-righteous, arrogant. In fact, going down there, you don't even see a, 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 a 10, a, a loving, to you get to 15%. Number 10. Or my favorite group again. Let's go to those, those people that identify themselves as not religious. You know, how, how do they see us? Judgmental did drop to number two. But have you heard that one before? You know, when they asked me, how do we get our friends to come to the church? How do we get them to see Jesus is relevant? And I think it's because the question goes back to, are we living like Jesus? Because when they look at us, not the other religions, those that are outside our walls, which is now those, the, the group of nuns, which is continuing to grow, they see us as hypocritical, judgmental, self-righteous, arrogant. It's not down till you get to, to, the, to the last four. Our last three, do you see something positive? Giving, friendly, compassionate. It's so real. Um, in fact, the only descriptor of those with no religion that was higher than, like I said, judgmental, and that's why I pointed that out, was hypocritical. So are we loving? As Christians, are we loving? Because remember, what are we called to do? Well, Jesus said, by this, everyone will know that you're a follower of mine. They'll know that you're a disciple. They'll know, as the song says, you're a Christian if you love one another. And the evidence that we're doing so, like Paul said, is bearing fruit. Bearing fruit. Living like Jesus. The fruit, the fruit, like, you know, apple tree, apple orange. Fruit, the fruit of the Spirit, that you're living like Jesus, first and foremost, love. So I say this just to get us to think, to get us to think, what if, what if we as Christians, what if we as a whole, what if we loved? What would our world 
look like? What would our world like? I, I heard this line from a movie once, but it is so true. Love is the most powerful thing on earth. Love is the most powerful thing on earth, and it can do some amazing things. So I want us to think about this. What if we, as Christians, you know, when we live like Jesus, when we love, when we focus on living like Jesus, we can do amazing things. I want us to think about this. What would happen if we truly loved? Think about all the walls in our world. Think about the things that even divide us in our church, in our churches. If we loved, the walls that divide us would fall. Hate would disappear. Love would rule. In fact, I was sitting with friends. Anybody watch the Super Bowl besides Jeff? Four of us, liars. Who watched the Super Bowl besides Jeff? For those who don't like football, I'll give you a pass. Uh, you watch that dog thing, don't you? And I love dogs, but I still watch the Super Bowl. But there was an ad that, that ran, and they were running it before the Super Bowl, but it got a lot of attention in the Super Bowl. It was by the Christian group, He Gets This. And if you paid attention to this advertisement, you see how this Christian organization, they sought to offer an image to the world of what if, what if the barriers, and they just put up these, if you pay close attention, you would see groups that would not normally work with each other. What if, what if the barriers of our walls fell? And I thought about this. And the sad part of it was even that advertisement drew controversy. Even that, by guess who? Christians. Ah. <laughs> Christians. Because they had to find some fault with it. They had to find some fault with it. But what this advertisement was inviting us to do was to, if you paid attention to it, instead of looking for faults, because often in our world we look at faults, were to take on the role of Jesus, to wash the feet of Jesus, wash the feet like Jesus did. That night when he was with his disciples, when he humbled himself, he took on the role of the servant and he taught, not, uh, not only witnessed what love looked like, he taught what love looked like. He taught what love looked like. And so what this advertisement invited you to do, if you pay attention to it truly without looking for controversy, it invited us to consider what if, what if, you know, that person, what if we loved as God desired? What if we saw our neighbor truly as our neighbor? All through the eyes of love, living like Jesus. And it made me think of, of course, the conversation that Jesus once had with an expert of the religious law. Luke in his gospel has this conversation taking place like this. He says, on one occasion, an expert of the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he has said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law? How do you read it? And the man said, what? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. I mean, this is what he, if we put this in 2024, that's what he learned in Sunday school. It's what he heard Warren and Jeff preach. It's what he heard in Bible study or a small group. They knew, he knew the answer. We, we know the answer. It goes back to the perception problem. We know the answer. But do we do it? Because Jesus says you've answered correctly. You've answered correctly. Do this. Do this. Love. And you'll live. See, Jesus invited the man, he invited the crown head, he invites us, whether we're here in person or online, he invites us all to consider what it looks like to truly love God, to give God our best, and to love our neighbors. And then he wanted to teach it through the parable of Good Samaritan. And if you don't know that one, that's what you can do this afternoon. You can, you can spend some time looking at it. But this is a beautiful parable. It's where it looks at how, you know, when religious ideals and race should not define how we relate to other people. It's a call to see a fellow human being truly through the eyes of love. 
That's what Jesus desires. Do this. All who claim the name of Jesus Christ. Do this. Love. So is Jesus relevant? Yeah. And I invite you to imagine, consider a world where we truly lived like Jesus taught. Not just giving the answer like the expert of the law did, but truly lived like Jesus taught. Spend time and study. I think that's something we need to do is spend time truly getting to know Jesus. Is church relevant? Yeah, it's a great place to come gather with friends and believers to talk about what does this passage mean? Is worship relevant? It's a place to, to focus, carve out time from the world to focus through whether it's songs uh, that we sing or that the choir leads us in. It's a place where we can carve out time, be intentional about spending Challenging ourselves like we are today to consider love. Is faith relevant? Yes, Jesus said, if you do this, they'll know you're a follower of mine. So what if we lived truly like Jesus taught? If we loved like Jesus loved? Where instead of marching in step with the world, a world which offers fear, cruelty, hate, violence, then we instead model something different, like kindness. We practice forgiveness. We, we extend grace. We extend love. But better yet, let's not just imagine. Let's as individuals, and at least here at Genesis, let's see how we can bear fruit. Let's see how we can love. Love as we are loved. Choir just showed us what that love looked like. How great is the Father's love. He gave His Son, His one and only Son, that whoever believed in Him would not perish, but have life. That's love. And Jesus invites us to learn to love like He loved as well. In fact, if you believe that we're called to live and to love like Jesus, and you long to commit to living and loving like Jesus. And I'm going to invite you to join in an affirmation of faith. If you, you can stand if, if, as you're able, or you, if you're able, or you can just sit. Um, but I invite you to respond um, if this is something that you feel called to do. But I invite you to stand and join with me if you're able. Number 883. <clears throat> we are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who is created and is creating, who is made, I mean, Jesus, and word made flesh to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to live with respect to creation, to love and to serve others, to seek justice, to resist evil, to proclaim Jesus, crucified and risen, our judge and our hope, in life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We're not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let's pray. Gracious, loving God, that is truly what you are, a loving God. And you invite us, who claim the name of Christ as Christians, to do the same. God, I, I just ask if there are those in this room that do not know love, and I just ask that through your Holy Spirit that they, they come to get to know the love that you have for them. God, you love all, all, not some, all. Those who have breath, those that were created in your image, you love. And with it, you call us to do the same to see the world as your son Jesus saw the world, to see the world as your son Jesus still sees the world, to be humble, to be a servant, to care, to meet the needs of others, to walk by the side of others, even those that are different from us. God, may we walk out of step from the world, a world that shows hate and violence, racism and sexism, and may we instead show love. May we, in essence, wash the feet of others. God, we pray this through your son, Jesus. Amen.
I invite you to join in in our final hymn, number 103. you to hear the good news, something that many of us learned as a kid. Jesus loves me. This I know. Jesus loves you. This I know and believe. But there's a whole world out there that does not know that love. There's a whole world that does not yet know Jesus. And our call is to live out of that love, to share that love, to invite others to come experience that love. And maybe we're, we don't know our story well enough to share with others, but we can invite them to come here and hear the good news, that they are loved, that this is a safe place where they can grow in an understanding of that love. And together, them, us, together, we can change the world. Before I leave, before we leave, I just want to say thank you for all you have done so far to make Genesis what it is. I know we've got a long journey still ahead of us. I know we've got stuff still rolling out this fall. And I'll be honest, at times it scares the heck out of me. Um, so I know Warren and I would ask for prayer. I know the leaders would ask for prayer. We ask that for guidance. We also ask for patience. Patience and love. Grace. Because we're going to make mistakes along the way, guys. And we just ask that you love us. But I hope you understand that we're just trying to share the good news of Jesus Christ. Again, I ask you to consider how, how that looks like in your life when you hear the opportunity to serve. Uh, you can talk to Carrie or, or someone else, but please say, here I am, Lord. Use me. We always need your support, also financially, just to do the things that we do. Um, we don't get government grants. We just do it together. And that's what giving boxes are for at the door and the kiosk or online. But together, guys, I just want us to change the world. I want Genesis to make a difference in the Roanoke Valley. And I hope you do too. Go in peace. God loves you. Amen.